We're here to talk about something that I am deeply persuaded we don't talk about enough. I don't think it gets the attention that it should get. I don't think that it's actually in the everyday, practical, street-level consciousness of the Christian community. I think there's language that we need to get a hold of again that will help us to understand ourselves and understand life and understand things that confuse us and dismay us and trouble us. We're really here to talk about why you're happy when you're happy, why you're sad when you're sad, why you're angry when you're angry, why you will be incredibly discouraged in your car and the person next to you, in the lane next to you, has a big smile on their face. What's up with that? What is all of that about? Well, I want to give you a proposition here. I want to explain it to you, and then I want to take you to a psalm. And that will probably take up our our time. At the bottom of every thought... At the bottom of every desire, at the bottom of every choice and decision, at the bottom of every word and action is the awe of something. Everything you do, everything you say, every response, every action or reaction is connected to the awe of something. The way you approach your marriage, the way you approach parenting, the way you approach friendships, the way you approach your neighbors, the way you think about your finances, the way you live in the leisure part of your life, the way you relate to your neighbors, the the things that you do and say as a citizen, all of those things are connected to awe. You may be thinking, well, Paul, I'm not sure... I know what you mean. Well, let me take you on a bit of a journey. As human beings, we're hardwired for awe. We're hardwired for glory. We are in a constant quest to be amazed, to live in wonder, to be able to connect ourselves to something that would satisfy our longing hearts. And here's how it works. God has placed us in an awesome created world. The world around us is filled with awesome things. Maybe that's the the power of a storm. And you hear the cracks of thunder and you see the lightning and you hear the rain pounding and the wind whistling and it makes you a little bit afraid. Or maybe that's the beauty of a sunset. I was in Wales recently and I took some some pictures of the sun coming down that were just absolutely breathtaking. Or maybe that's just on your deck watching a hummingbird and seeing the seemingly inexhaustible wings of this little bird as it darts back and forth like this. It captures you for a moment. Or maybe that's the smell of a beautiful steak sizzling and you think life is good. I have steak in my life. There must be a God. (laughs) Or maybe that's a kiss, or the lumbering, thunderous gait of an elephant, or the sound of a newborn's cry, or the taste of a seven-layer chocolate mousse cake. Now, why has God created this, this world of such 
awesome things because every created thing that's awesome is meant to be a finger that points us to the God who created all of those things. See, the, the awesome things of this world are ne were never intended to satisfy your heart. They'll never satisfy your heart. They'll never bring you lasting peace. They'll never bring you lasting rest. They'll never give you what your heart longs for. Created glory is not meant to be your stopping point. The awesome things of creation will never be your Savior. Earth will never be your Savior. Wasn't attended to. And for all the satisfaction of that, you end up hungry again, don't you? Maybe you're a man, I think this is sort of a man thing, and you've gone to one of those ridiculous steakhouse places that actually offers you a 48-ounce cowboy ribeye steak. It's the size of a roast for a family of six. They bring it on a platter bigger than a plate. It still lops over the end. You go, yeah, steak. And you actually eat the whole thing. Unbelievable, but you do. And you walk out of the restaurant and you say, oh, I'm stuffed. I don't think I'm going to eat a thing tomorrow. And shockingly, the next day you're actually hungry. See, every created thing that's awesome, that makes you wonder, that stops you, that makes you want to look and experience and celebrate is meant to be a finger that will point you to the awesome glory of God because you were hardwired to find your identity, your meaning and purpose, your deepest sense of well-being in His awesome glory. And so all those things are not meant to be stopping points. They're meant to drive you to this one whose awesome character, awesome glory can give rest and meaning and purpose and direction to your life. Now hear what I'm about to say. What we're talking about right now is not first spirituality. What we're talking about is humanity. This is the way every human being was intended to live. Every human being was intended to live with the awe of God as the fundamental, baseline, ultimate motivation for everything that human being does. That's not first spirituality. That's the way God designed every human being to live. It's humanity. So that you could say to me, Paul, why do you think the things you think? And I could say, because of my awe of God. Why do you spend your money the way you spend your money? I'd say my awe of God. Why do you treat your children the way you treat your children? Because of my awe of God. Why do you act the way you do in your marriage? Well, because of my awe of God. That everything in my life would be directed by this one big, huge thing that now grips and motivates my heart. It's the awe of God. Now, here's what you need to understand there's no such thing as an aweless human being. Because all of us were hardwired for all, so that capacity of all will locate itself somewhere. And there are only two possibilities. There's created all and God all. That's just the two possibilities. And so if... If my heart isn't ruled by awe of God, it will be ruled somehow by awe of something that God created. If it's not vertical, it will be horizontal. And that, that war of awe lives 
in the heart of every human being who has ever taken a breath. That little baby that has no idea of diet at all, this 19-month-old is not a dietitian, but she'll close her mouth like a vice so you can't get anything in it because you will not tell this little girl what to eat. Try it. Some of you are looking at me with, with knowing faces. Now, I would propose to you, that little girl doesn't have a diet problem. She has an awe problem. She wants to live in the center of her world. She wants all of life to be about her. She wants to be the only authority that she has in her life. She's living, although she has no idea that she is, in awe of herself. And she's saying to her parents, it's nice that you live with me. It's nice that you help me on occasions, but don't tell me what to do. And she will make your life difficult when you try. Listen, parents, you need to understand this. That's not first a law problem. That's first an all problem that produces a law problem for that little girl. That's every human being. Because we're hardwired for all. Now, I want to take you to... Psalm 27. If you would turn there with me in your pew Bible there or on your iPhone or iPad or whatever weird, sad, off-brand you're carrying. <laughs> and I want to... I wanna, give you a bit of an introduction, and then tell you a bit of a personal story, and uh, then we'll look at the psalm. Psalm 27 is a psalm of trouble. I'll talk about uh, the history behind this psalm. But perhaps nothing exposes the all that's captured my heart better than trouble does. Nothing reveals more what has captured me in this area of awe than suffering. October 19th of this past year, my life changed. I didn't know my life was going to change. I didn't want my life to change, but my life changed. I was having what I thought were minor physical symptoms, and I called my doctor, and he said, you live in Center City, Philadelphia, you live right next to one of the best uh, hospitals in the city, just walk over to the hospital, let them check you out. So I was really quite relaxed. Uh, Sunday afternoon at the church, Lowell and I, Luella, my dear wife, and I walked over to the hospital. We stopped at Starbucks on the way, one of the proofs of the existence of God. And uh, we were just enjoying ourselves. We sat in the emergency room there and watched the Philadelphia Eagles play football. That was painful. Uh, and they took me into the emergency room. I was really quite relaxed. I even asked one of the physicians in the midst of my examination if I would be going home quickly. He looked at me like I was crazy before 
very long, there were residents from five different departments of the hospital in my emergency room. I realized I wouldn't be going home anytime soon. What I didn't realize, because I didn't have any of the symptoms that you would expect a person to have, I was an acute renal failure. My kidneys were dying. If I had waited seven to ten days longer, I wouldn't be with you this evening. The next three days were just a horror. Uh, because of all the things that were happening in my body, my body went into trauma. I was having these horrible full body spasms. It was the most painful thing I ever experienced. My son was with me, 36 years old, and he said, Dad, I didn't realize that pain at that level existed. I'm not embarrassed to say this. I, I wanted to die. I couldn't. It wasn't that I couldn't imagine the next day. I couldn't imagine the next five minutes. They terrified me. I couldn't imagine going through that pain over and over and over again. The only prayer that could come out of my mouth was, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. I was in the hospital for 10 days, had operations since, all kinds of medical complications. The result is I did irreparable damage to my kidneys, left with about 35% of my kidney function. Changed everything in my life. The way I do ministry, just the way I live. It doesn't, one hand, make any sense to me that at the point of my greatest ministry influence, I'm rendered the weakest I've ever been in my life. Now, here's the point of my story. You never come to those moments empty. You never come to those moments in life neutral. When you suffer, you never just suffer the thing that you're suffering. You also suffer the way that you're suffering the thing that you're suffering. Because you always bring your heart and whatever has captured your heart, you always are interpreting your suffering. You're always saying significant things to yourself. I say this all the time, and people think that I'm being humorous, and I'm really quite serious. No one's more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. You smiled. I'm really quite serious. You're, you're in a constant conversation with yourself. Most of us have learned it's best not to move our lips. Because they'll think you're a bit crazy. And when you're talking to yourself, don't change places. They'll put you away. But, but you're always bringing this capacity for all into all of those experiences in ways you may not understand, it shapes the way you even suffer. Suffering's never neutral because everyone in this room is a theologian. Everyone in this room is a philosopher. Everyone in this room is an archaeologist that by some means will seek to make sense out of your life. Let me read just the first four verses of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat at my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, 
That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The scholars who study these things say that this psalm was written out of one of two very difficult moments in David's life. Either was written in that moment where David is fleeing from King Saul. David had done nothing wrong to to Saul. He had been a loyal, faithful servant of the king, but the anointing and power of God was on David, and Saul was obsessed with vengeful jealousy and was out to do David harm, and David had to escape for his life. It was a situation of gross personal injustice. Or other scholars say that perhaps this psalm was written in that moment when David was fleeing from his son Absalom. You remember the story. Absalom, his son, had had conspired to take David's throne. And in a monarchy, if you're going to take the throne of a king, it means the king's going to die. And David is literally running from his life because of the conspiracy and betrayal of his own boy. And when you're reading this story, you just have a sense that that this story is not going to have a good ending. And the report comes that Absalom's dead. And David doesn't rejoice. It's one of the most poignant family moments in the Bible, he crumbles as a father would and says, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. Now it's in the blood, dirt, and grit, smoke of real life experiences that this psalm is written. This psalm is precious not just because of its content, but that content is made even more precious as you understand the moment in which this psalm was written. This is not pie-in-the-sky theology here. This is real life. And if you look there at Psalm 27, it's interesting to know that although This psalm is written out of trouble. It doesn't begin with trouble. It begins with theology. And that's not unusual. It is actually true that every person brings theology, some kind of theology, to every moment in their life. There's... There's something that they're worshiping, something that gives them meaning and purpose, something that wakes them up in the morning. Because every person's hardwired for all, every person is a worshiper, so you, you always bring theology to that moment, you always bring what you worship to that moment, and that system of worship, or for our purpose, that system of all, really interprets for you what you're facing in your life. Look what what David says here. The Lord is light. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is stronghold. In the broadest sense, what does light mean in Scripture? What is it a metaphor of? It's a picture of everything that's right, true, good, holy, righteous, that Uh, above this world reigns one who is the ultimate definition of everything that's true, everything that's right, everything that's holy, everything that's just. The Lord is salvation in the broadest sense. What does salvation mean? Deliverance from evil, evil inside, and ultimately evil outside of me. The Lord is is stronghold. The word picture there too, a hiding place, a protection place, a place of refuge. The Lord is light. 
the Lord is salvation. The Lord is stronghold. Now, I'm about to confuse you, so you need to pay attention here. What I've given you right now is bad theology. It's bad, will hurt you theology. Do you know why? Because if you look at your Bible, I left out a word. I left it out three times. You know what the word is? You can talk. It's legal. My. Say it like you mean it. <laughs> the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. Listen to me say this. Enough of academic, impersonal, abstract theology that's divorced from your existence. It's not the theology of the Word of God. No wonder we can hold on to that theology and still be searching for something to give us awe, be shopping for awe horizontally. Because theology properly understood doesn't just define God, it redefines me as a child of God. Because David is speaking better than he knows. What David is actually saying, this theology is later developed in Scripture, is that glorious grace has connected me to this one who is light. Glorious grace has connected me to this one who is salvation. Glorious grace has connected me to this one who is awesome. He's light for me. He's salvation for me. He's stronghold for me. Do you feel the difference in that? David is actually saying this profound thing that is meant to make us weak in the knees. It's meant to stop our hearts. It's meant to make our jaws drop. It's meant to silence us in wonder and awe that everything that God is, He is for us by grace. Wow! The total expanse of His glory has been unleashed on us by grace. It's sad that Christians spend themselves in the debt and search for life. It's sad that people eat one another up in marriage, searching for something another human being can never give you. It's sad that we eat ourselves into ill health, carrying around the empirical evidence of our gluttony because we're searching for satisfaction. It's sad that the average American home is ridiculously expensive and the average home, the average person buys a new home every five years. That's craziness. That's a transient society looking for something. It's sad that we treat the church of Jesus Christ like we're consumers, like it's ecclesiastical Macy's. Asking the church to meet our own little definition of what will satisfy us. Listen, all of those things that I described are all problems. Because if all of God is not blowing you away in such a way that it structures your life, you will shop for awesome things horizontally. And it will mess up your life. Now, I like where this psalm goes next. Listen to these words. 
When evildoers assail me, my adversaries and foes, though an army encamp against me, though war rise against me, pretty real. I love how shockingly honest the Bible is. I mean, there are stories in the Bible that are so weird and tawdry, if, probably if they were in a paperback book at your local bookstore, you wouldn't buy them. Now, why is that? Because, because God wants us to understand that the arms of His awesome grace wrap themselves around the full extent of the human experience. Let me say it this way. Biblical faith will never require that you have to deny reality. Living in all of God never demands that you play monkey games with life in a fallen world. That you have to act like you're not facing the things that you're facing. In fact, it's only ever fear that disarms fear. Fear is the only solution to fear. Because it's only fear of God. It's only that ultimate, uh, heart-engaging, mind-controlling reverence of God that disarms the fear of other things in my life. This, this guy who wrote this psalm gives you an example of that in the Valley of Elah. Remember, Israel is assembled against the Philistine army. They're armed for battle. On the very first day, that, that huge warrior Goliath comes out and basically says, send me your best soldier. Guess what the army of Israel does? They go back to the tents and commiserate. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? They do that for 40 days. What a bunch of all amnesiacs. This is the army of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Most High God. This guy, God said, I will deliver those enemies into your hands. I am the Lord. David shows up. A little bit of humor in the story to deliver a lunch to his brothers. Bread and cheese. And they sort of mock him, go back to your little lambs, and he asks, these are my words, the fateful question, why aren't we fighting? Now, is he arrogant, full of himself, delusional? Why would he say such a thing? Well, you know where he is. He says this. He delivered the lion, speaking of God, he delivered the bear, and he will deliver this Philistine this day. You see, it's fear of God that disarms David's fear of Goliath. It's all of God that drives David into that valley. And when he's when I'm reading this and he's walking toward that giant with nothing but a shepherd's cloak and a measly sling and five silly stones, I hear the timpani drums begin to roll. And the rolling louder as he gets close to the giant and then he loads the sling and he starts doing this and I hear the, the cymbals begin to crash. He lets go of that stone. It hits the temple of that giant, knocks him out, and David runs up and takes the giant sword and cuts off his head. There's an awesome painting at the Metropolitan Museum in New York of that shepherd young man holding this severed head by the hair. All of God. That's what it does for you. Now think with me, and then I'm about done. 
If you had an army in camp against you, actually, you had people out to do you harm. I love this word picture, to eat up your flesh. That sounds nice. People that were, were set to do you harm. What would be the one thing that you would desire? What would be the one thing that you would pray for? How about weapons? That makes sense to me. Just give me bigger weapons than my enemy. How about fire? Lord, just incinerate them. You're the God of fire. This is easy for you. Or you've prayed these prayers, I'm sure. How about just suck me out and drop me somewhere else? I think we pray a lot of prayers. Lord, and if you get me out of here, I will sing Great is Thy Faithfulness, I promise. <laughs> is, is David dis- delusional? Is he so super spiritual that we can't relate to him? Why would he say, in the midst of this trouble, the thing that I desire is to go to the temple and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Because David understands this. He understands that there exists in the universe one of such awesome, stunning, incalculable beauty that is way more beautiful than anything you will ever face in your life. He's way more beautiful than any ugly thing you'll face. He's beautiful in love. He's beautiful in mercy. He's beautiful in faithfulness. He's beautiful in sovereignty. He's beautiful in wisdom. He's beautiful in grace. He's beautiful in patience. He's beautiful in compassion. He's beautiful. 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 And you will only ever understand the things that you face and know how to deal with them when you look at life through the stunning lens of the awesome beauty of your Redeemer. There it is. Maybe the trouble in our life is not people is not situations, is not locations. Maybe the trouble in our life is vertical all amnesia. Or maybe another way to say it, all wrongedness. All that's meant to be reserved for God. Now, located in the thing that is meant to point us to God. And listen, when what you've placed your all in is at stake, you will not deal with that well. We're hardwired for all. And that capacity... that gives us wonder and amazement is meant to drive us to God because we are meant to live with Him and live for Him to find our deepest motivation, our highest joys, our most unshakable rest in Him. The life of of every human being is a story of awe. The question is, awe of what? Let's pray. Lord, thank you how your 
word points us to things about ourselves, about you, about life that we would never understand apart from your word. And for all our thankfulness for your word, we are so deeply thankful for you, you in your awesome glory who stands behind the words in your book. And we are so grateful for the personal work of Jesus Christ who has connected us to your glory so we can rest in the reality that all that you are, you are for us by grace. Thank you. May that stop us. May that enthuse us. May that encourage us. May that confront us. May that motivate us. May that transform us. In Jesus' name, amen.